Alrighty, we wrap up chapter 10 with these last two groups that are listed in the chapter title, right? We're going to talk about amines and sulfur containing compounds. But first, before we get into either of those, we're going to touch just briefly on one thing we left off in the world of epoxides from that longer third video. And that was the world of arine oxides. So we've seen arenes before, though we really haven't used that vocabulary. An arene is an aromatic hydrocarbon. Benzene is the one that we all quickly recognize. An arene oxide has taken one of the pi bonds in that aromatic ring and converted it to an epoxide. So you see here, right, going from benzene to benzene oxide. This is an arene oxide. That conversion seems kind of weird, right? Because we're destroying that aromaticity, but it's something that's frequently done in the body to convert aromatic rings to something that's more water soluble so that eventually these things can be excreted like in urine. Yeah. And these arine oxides are special because they can react as a normal epoxide, which we have here, or they can rearrange to form phenols, right? So we see here, right, reacting as an epoxide to form some addition products, remember that's that anti-addition, or we rearrange to form a phenol. And you know, the first, before we dive into this, because we're gonna look at the mechanism for the rearrangement next, you'll have a little bit of this on your homework, but my key takeaway here from chapter 10 is knowing the normal rea reactions of epoxides from the third video, that's a lot more significant, hence why I left this for the fourth and final video. Okay. But the conversion from the epoxide to phenol isn't all that surprising, right? We have an acid in solution that protonates oxygen. We've seen that before. And then this is the weird step, right? We just break that sigma bond to put the lone pair of electrons on oxygen. It's a ring opening reaction. And that can happen because it forms a resonant stabilized carbocation. This is the rate determining slow step here. And what's a kind of a failure of the textbook here is it should show all those resonance contributors. Okay. You've got a resonance contributor with positive charge here, here, and over here, right? Three resonance contributors to that relatively stable carbocation. That's what permits this reaction to proceed. Yep. Then we have a hydride shift. Yeah, that's what's going from top right to down Right to the bottom left here, we're kind of going across, right, just like a book down here. Yeah, it's called an NIH shift because that's where it was first discovered. But that hydrogen shifts over right, at the same time this lone pair of electrons comes down, forms what's known as a protonated dienone. Okay, so diene from these two right here, two alkenes, diene, own from that double bonded oxygen. Yeah. And then we just pluck off a hydrogen right, right here. Those electrons restore the aromaticity, and we formed our phenol. And the easier it is to form that carbocation, because that's the rate determining step, the faster the reaction will occur. Right? So here we see an even more stable carbocation. Right? Faster reaction, the more we see that conversion happening. Okay. So Know that arine oxides are a special class of reactant. Know they can rearrange to phenols and know how for your homework. But the other thing that's interesting is that those arine oxides are actually carcinogenic. You probably know that benzene is carcinogenic, for example. Uh, but aromatic hydrocarbons aren't carcinogenic on their own if they were just left alone in the body. It's the arine oxides themselves that are actually carcinogenic because of the reactivity of that epoxide. Okay. So if we look at an example of an arine oxine here, okay, with two deoxyguanosine, it's just got one less hydroxyl than the normal guanosine you're used to in your base pairs. Uh, it's got an NH2 right here. That electron density can attack the epoxide acting as a nucleophile right here. And then after it does that and forms a new bond to the arine oxide, this guy can't fit into a double helix. Yep. So that means that the strands can't form properly. Your genetic code isn't going to be properly transcribed. You get mutations, you get cancer. And so it's actually the arine oxides that are carcinogenic, not 
aromatic rings on their own. Okay. So that concludes the world of epoxides, just touching on aryan oxides there. Next, we've got amines. Okay? And this is a more notable part of chapter 10. Definitely no amines. Okay? But the good news is they're very easy. When we have an amine group, they don't undergo substitution or elimination reactions on their own. They're not even really considered to be a part of group two, which this chapter is all about. Okay? Now, if we protonate the amino group, that makes it a better leaving group. Okay? And then we're into a little bit of business. Okay? So even though, going through the slides here, even though we've got a nitrogen, okay, nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon. So we have a nitrogen electron withdrawing group that's bonded to an sp3 hybridized carbon. That higher pKa in the poorer leaving group means these things don't really react. Okay, because of the weaker acid, stronger conjugate base. Right? NH2 is not going to be kicked off. So right, look at those reactivities. We saw alcohol halides in chapter nine, right? We've talked about alcohols and ethers, right? but look at that jump in pK. An amine is not going to react on its own. Okay? So if we think about protonating it, that would make it a better leaving group. Okay? But even then, Right? It's still not as good of a leaving group as a protonated alcohol. Okay. So that's why amines don't usually react in substitution or elimination reactions because they're such a worse leaving group. <clears throat> but that's not to say that amines aren't important and they don't do anything because the lone pair that we have on nitrogen, as we've seen, allows amines to react as bases and as nucleophiles. Okay? All of these, it's showing them in the acidic form, right? but they've picked up a proton. Amines are really common bases. And if they're acting as a nucleophile, they can react with al alkyl halides, or as we just saw, with epoxides. Yeah. You can take an amine and kick off an alkyl halide. You can take an amine and open an epoxide ring. Yeah. So they can act as nucleophiles, they can act as bases, they can act as solvents. But one thing we haven't thought of, and, and this is really the thing to know from chapter 10, is quaternary ammonium ions, okay? A nitrogen when you have four alkyl groups coming off of it. Right? Primary is one, secondary is two, tertiary is three. Usually we stop there, but we do have quaternary ammonium ions. Four alkyl groups means we have a positive charge on nitrogen. And if you have that group specifically, you can do an elimination reaction using a strong base. Okay, so a couple of notes here, right? First, let me bring to your attention. It's a named reaction called the Hoffman elimination. So that should signal to you that it's important to know. Okay. Hoffman elimination, here's what you need if you're creating a list. Quaternary ammonium ion, strong base, heat. And the reason we need that heat is because even though we've got the best leaving group possible with an amine, it's still not great. So we have to heat the reaction and we can get it to do an elimination, okay? As long as we have those three things, quaternary ammonium, heat, and a strong base. So hydroxide works. Let's see what that mechanism looks like. It's an E2 reaction here. Yeah, so meaning everything's happening all at once. Hydroxide is coming in, pulling off, one of your beta hydrogens, that electron density is shifting over to form the pi bond. And simultaneously, that carbon nitrogen bond is breaking. Okay. Then we form our alkene, as we know we form from elimination reactions, plus amine and water as byproducts. Okay. But the question becomes uh, here in this situation, I only have one beta carbon. Okay. I couldn't pull off any of these hydrogens because right, those are alpha hydrogens. That wouldn't work. I have to pull off a beta hydrogen. What if you have multiple beta carbons? Yep. This reaction, the Hoffman elimination, pulls from the beta carbon that's bonded to the most hydrogen, which is actually anti-Zaitsev. Yep. So the base removes the hydrogen from whichever beta carbon was bonded to the most hydrogens. Right? Think about this from like Robin Hood, it's, riding, it's robbing the rich. Okay. 
And why is that? Because that probably seems weird if you stop here and think about it, right? Because the major product then of the Hoffman elimination is the lesser substituted alkene, okay? But it is the fact of that poor leaving group, that quaternary ammonium ion, that leads us to getting the anti zetzev product and pulling it off whatever beta carbon had more hydrogens. Okay? Look at these transition states here. When we have a bad leaving group, that bond doesn't break easily. So it gives us a carbanion like transition state because this bond is so hesitant to break, it puts a lot of electron density on the carbon there. Okay, so carbanions, remember, are the opposite of carbocations. They don't like to be substituted. Unlike, right, when we have a good leaving group, like a bromine or a protonated alcohol, that's why we get the Zaitsev product because we want that to be the more substituted alkene. But here, that carbanion doesn't want to be substituted. Okay? So again, good leaving group over here, good leaving group starts to leave immediately. Our transition state is looking like the alkene. Okay? When we have a bad leaving group over here, it does not leave quickly or easily. So the negative charge builds up, we get a transition state that resembles a carbanion. Okay. And again, keep in mind, you have to have a hydroxide ion for the Hoffman reaction to occur. I get a, got a little ahead of myself, I'm gonna jump back here, All right? Quaternary ammonium ion, heat and hydroxide, strong base, get used to using that, okay? Now, one thing for using the Hoffman elimination is if you have a quaternary ammonium, it's got a positive charge. So typically that has a counter ion. Like if you were to purchase these things, right? Here we've got an iodide counter ion. So how do you get it to get hydroxide instead? Because you can't just plug in something with a negative charge there, but you can use silver oxide. And silver oxide will convert your ammonium halide, ammonium iodide in this case, to ammonium hydroxide, right, and it precipitates out silver iodide. Okay. So you don't have to worry about that. Just know if you're designing a Hoffman elimination, or if I ask you what's used in a Hoffman elimination, you're going to use the hydroxide ion. Yeah. So that wraps up amines, which is really just quaternary amines, because anything else is not going to react unless it's serving as a nucleophile or a base. But it's certainly not going to be a leaving group unless it's got that positive charge. So let's finish the chapter and finish this video with thiols. You've heard me use that word a couple of times already. Okay, what is a thiol? Thiol is like an alcohol, except instead of oxygen, it has sulfur. So instead of our OHs, we have SHs. Okay? And you might see these, if you're looking at old resources, re referred to as mercaptans, okay, because they pick up mercury in solution not used as much nowadays, but if you see mercaptan, it's another word for a thiol. Don't worry about that reaction, just know that they happen. New functional group means we actually need a little bit of new nomenclature. It's been a minute since we've covered nomenclature rules, but with a new group, we have to know how to name it, okay? So how do we name it, okay? Name thiol like you would alcohol. And that's going to control your nomenclature, unless there's another functional group that is going to be a higher priority. Okay, so these first three examples are just thiol. So those are pieces of cake. Okay, but over here, alcohol is going to control the suffix. So if that's the case, another functional group controlling the suffix, then you use a mercapto prefix. Okay, mercapto to indicate a thiol group. Okay, so this is ethanol. Right, CH2, CH2OH, and we have the SH on carbon two, so two mercaptoethanol. Okay. Otherwise, you just name it as an alcohol, except instead of OL at the end, it's thiol. And because thiol starts with a T, right, we don't drop the E at the end. So this would be ethanol, goes to ethane thiol. They're actually pretty easy. You already know how to name alcohols. Now you just put thiol instead and bring the E back in. It, sulfur is not as electronegative as oxygen, so we don't have hydrogen bonding with thiols. 
weaker IMF and lower boiling points overall. Okay. But because of that, and the fact that sulfur is larger and can spread out a negative charge when it's acting as a conjugate base, it's more stable as a conjugate base. And that means that thiols are actually stronger acids than alcohols. And thiolate ions are better nucleophiles because of that polarizability, okay? So if I have a protic solvent, now my thiol can act as a nucleophile, okay? And then I can form this guy, which is an ether, but sulfur instead of oxygen, it's called a thioether, okay? also known as a disulfide. Okay? So thiolate ions, get used to seeing them. You can use them in protic solvents, okay? bam, right there can to react with alkyl halides and they react even better than an alkoxide would here. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Here we see another example right here. Okay. We've got that polarizability. So even if it doesn't have a negative charge, it's still a pretty decent nucleophile. Okay. So Jumping back here, right here, we had a negative charge it's called the thiolate. Jumping forward aside, here, that thioether, which was actually formed right here, this is a thioether, this is a thioether, right? those thioethers can actually serve as nucleophiles themselves because of the polarizability and the larger size of sulfur. Yep. And that forms a sulfonium salt over here, positive charge on sulfur. That's nice because then I've got a positive charge and something that's a really good leaving group. Okay? So it'll react with other nucleophiles. Let's see what that looks like. Now, if I introduce hydroxide into solution, okay, that can come in, attack one of those carbons. Now this is a leaving group down here. Okay? And look at that, in solution, I form methanol and I'm back to having a thioether. That's called an alkylating agent. You take this guy in solution, right? add it to, for example, hydroxide or another strong base or good nucleophile, and it comes in and attacks an alkyl group. Okay? So you've added that CH3 to OH, hence alkylating agent. <clears throat> and that's something that actually has a role in your body as well to wrap up some of these reactions of amines and thiols. Um, so know those reactions that we just covered in thiols. The next thing we're going to jump into for three or four slides here is biochemistry. A lot of these chapters end in biochem, as you've seen already. None of this is explicitly tested, but you know, just to put it on your radar moving forward. Okay, see that world of biochem, what that is actually happening inside of you. So the first question, what if you wanted to add a methyl group in the lab? Okay, well, what we just saw was one way to do it. I wanted to add an alkyl group to something. Well, if it's trying to be quick and easy and cheap, we know a primary alkyl halide is very reactive. So I can add a variety of nucleophiles here. It's gonna attack that primary carbon, kick off iodine, and you're done. But there's a couple of problems. Methyl iodide is sparingly soluble in water. So that's not going to work in your body because your body is really an aqueous biological system. So you can't put something that's sparingly soluble in there. Plus, it would react with everything and be carcinogenic anyway. So what do your cells do? Okay. Well, your cells use some of that reaction we just saw. Look at that positive leaving group on sulfur. Good leaving group there. That's contained within this guy, Sam. Okay, acidenosomethionine. That gives us a water soluble, which is key for our body, sulfonium ion leaving group. And okay? this whole thing in your body is acting as a leaving group to selectively add a methyl group okay, to a variety of nucleophiles. And that's effectively what biochem is, recognizing what these things are and their roles and tying it back to reactions you already know. Okay? Really everything else that's contained within SAM here uh, is for molecular recognition in the body. So it reacts properly. So what's an example of where you need to add an alkyl group? Yeah, where alkylation is important? 
well, how about how about your fight or flight, right? Going noradrenaline to adrenaline. Look at the difference right here. Noradrenaline, norepinephrine, structure down here. Adrenaline, structure over here. The only difference is that CH3. Okay. And that comes from SAM. And hopefully you know adrenaline, right? Its role in the human body. It's way more potent, like six times more potent than noradrenaline to breaking down your glycogen stores and giving you energy in that fight or flight. Yep. So that's biochem. Again, not, none of that on those three slides there would be tested, but it's just an example of where this actually has a role in the real world. And that wraps up group two. Yep. Between chapter nine and chapter 10, chapter nine was all about alcohol halides. Chapter 10 was everything else here. It's largely all the same stuff. We've got a partial positive charge on our sp3 hybridized carbon because it's attached to some sort of electron withdrawing group. Yep. So that's the question. Does it react with a nucleophile in a substitution reaction? Or does it pull off a hydrogen and do an elimination reaction? And that's what group two is all about. Okay. We'll take a break from this chart for a little bit moving forward. Dive into the world of organometallics and then some analytical chemistry methods. But we will return in just a little bit. Okay. Chapter 15 gets us into group three. I've got two summary slides contained at the end of your Blackboard slide. Okay. They are gross oversimplifications between slides 93 and 94 there. Okay. Take a look at your notes. It's just a quick thing to kind of serve as the header for those individual sections of notes. But it all comes down to knowing the individual reactions, especially for alcohols, there's a bunch of them. The mechanisms are remarkably similar, nothing too different there but know all the different conditions and how these things will react. Do they substitute, substitute, do they eliminate, or is it something like an amine that doesn't react at all? Get all that down pat and you'll be ready to roll for chapter 10.